but I do want to make sure that we uh, continue to move along. So um, this week we are, I, you'll notice that the beginning of the week is still dedicated to Islam, right? Just because there is so much to cover, especially in terms of issues related to gender and the particular issue of uh, veiling, right, is is so robust and there are obviously so many different degrees because there are so many different degrees of veiling, right? Different ways in which one uh, could cover or be required to cover obviously varies across different parts of the world, right? In terms of culture versus actual legislation. But then you have this sort of reverse side of it where you see people attempting, right? It's sort of supposedly coming from a good place even if it is coming from a good place, you see uh, legislation like burqa bans, right? And so these end up having um, very similar impacts, ironically, right? If not worse, <laughs> uh, then, <laughs> yeah. So um, I wanted to give us a space to, to talk about that and to answer any lingering questions or uh, things that you wanted to talk about, about Islam or women in Islam before we dive into newer religions which we'll spend the second half of this class on and then all of Thursday on. So uh, any questions, you can pop them in the chat. You can raise your hand in the video. Just unmute yourself as long as no one else is speaking. Are you all familiar with some of the burqa ban laws? Actually, as much as we were praising France earlier, <laughs> they're one of the worst offenders. Um, and so it's this sort of weird tension you have between even very progressive, right? Again, perhaps well-intentioned, right? Trying to protect women from uh, exploitation, from oppression, right? So they, they clearly see the burqa as only... <laughs> a method of oppressing women, right? Um, and this has, you know, special regional and cultural significance, right? Uh, France, like a bunch of Western Europe, but in particular, France has a very different relationship with sexuality than America and most other parts of the world, right? And that they're much more comfortable with it, right? Um, and so, you know, they would be, I'm assuming, particularly sensitive, right? Um, to the covering of women's bodies, right? To the shaming of women's sexuality and so forth, as we see in much of the religious traditions, but especially in the Abrahamic traditions. Um, and so one of the ways they've tried to address this is to just ban it, right? Um, to make sure that you can't, you know, be making someone wear it. But they did not make similar laws banning other religious symbols, right? So it comes off as very Islamophobic. Um, it also has these horrifying, horrifying implications. Uh, the, the particular story that sticks out in my mind, um, I read it in a local paper. Uh, I happened to be traveling in Europe at the time. And so I, I don't even know if this is a story that reached the States, but I'm sure other stories like this you've probably seen on social media. Um, but it was a woman who was at the beach in a burkini, right? Uh, so a lot of businesses, um, especially those that cater to athletes, are, you know, coming up with new different types of wares, right? Clothing and attire that um, has the same effect, right? In terms of what it's covering in parts of your body, but made out of, you know, some of our new, I don't know, tech savvy materials that like breathe and do all kinds of things with your sweat. I don't know, uh, right? But there's, there's stuff going on there. And so, um, right, that kind of stuff is important so that women who do choose to cover, right, to whatever extent and for whatever reason, have the same sorts of options available to them in terms of what they're able to do without the, you know, having to worry about heat ex exhaustion and things like this that might be restricting you if you were using more classical materials, right? Again, that depends on where you are, the environment, and all types of things. But um, this particular law in France that banned burqas also applied to burkinis. And so this woman was at the beach, and the police made her remove her burkini. Now, I'm sure on no planet did any politician ever intend, right, for this to be an implication of this law. But, right, any law... <laughs> having to do with the regulation 
of women's clothing, women's choices, women's bodies, they inevitably, right, end up hurting, harming, infringing upon women's choices, right, more so than helping, right, even, even when well-intentioned in this case. So, yeah, good. There's also differences here between uh, generations, right? And I think this can be said in all kinds of contexts. There are differences of opinions between generations, but absolutely um, fashion, modesty, right? Uh, the way in which one chooses to present themselves, these things are entirely generational specific, right? And even subgroups, right? Like I'm a millennial versus a Gen Z. I, like, I don't even know all of the different, <laughs> like, do you even know what label, you, right? You could be like so many things. Exactly. So right, we have all these categories and yeah, we can make like certain generalizations and patterns, but the reason that we like to name them is because we tend to like to point out the differences of opinions between them, right? And, and why they're, uh, try, it helps us sort of try to explain gaps, right, or challenges, reasons why there's maybe conflict. Um, and perhaps you encountered some of this conflict with your dialogue if you chose someone of a different generation than you or of a different peer group, right? That can often be, that might have been where you intentionally looked as an indicate, like you knew, okay, if I pick someone who's older than me, they're probably going to disagree with me, right? Like that might have even been part of your thinking process. Yes. So absolutely, those generational differences are huge. And I think, I mean, this might just be, you know, a result of the consumer culture that we happen to find ourselves in, but like fashion and style in particular seem to be generally, generationally different. Um, I've even heard comedians make comments about this in terms of like, you can tell the last decade uh, an old man was good looking because he dresses like that decade for the rest of his life, like whatever, whatever it was. And people sort of do that, right? Like they, they pick a style at a certain point in their life and then they stick it with it. <laughs> Not everybody, you know, sort of, and who's criticized for updating and trying to dress youthful. Oh, well, women are, <laughs> right? We criticize them if they don't, we criticize them if they do. So yeah, the the dressing, the generational stuff with women, especially there's so much loaded in this. Yeah. Um, so is there some sort of common ground that women between generations can reach without the influence in that? And that's such a big con conditional, <laughs> like without the influence of men. Is there anything, <laughs> anything that is outside of the influence of men? First, if we could, I don't, I, I worry that there isn't. Um, so unfortunately, I think not with that condition, but I don't think that that means that we can't, you know, find common ground. Um, you know, if anything, the fact that, and I'm going to stereotype here, right, I'm generalizing, so this doesn't apply to everybody, but on the whole, we could probably say that older generations, right, are going to be perhaps more entrenched in the patriarchy, as if I could just shorthand it for you, right? Uh, hopefully we all kind of understand what I mean. But, um, you know, they've maybe done more of that internalizing than we have. I definitely am constantly on my mom about it because, you know, it's the kind of stuff that she used to use to criticize herself and me when I was young. And now that I'm old enough to see it for what it is, I'm like her therapist and I'm like, stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> stop talking so negatively about yourself stop judging yourself about how you look stop comparing it right all the things I don't know maybe these conversations resonate with you right but if anything the common ground I think has to be based in, in empathy for where they're coming from because and this is very Socratic right this is very much again perhaps uh, a tactic you employed in your dialogue people are much more willing to engage with ideas that differ from their own if they don't feel crit attacked, right? So in my younger years, <laughs> I, I had not uh, cultivated this skill <laughs> and, and many a fight ensued, <laughs> right? <laughs> As I age, I become better at navigating uh, the specific people around me, right? Uh, figuring out, reading social cues, learning what what works best right all of the things one learns as one ages especially with members of your family and so I have found personally in my experience that figuring out where they're coming from and making the argument from there is much more effective 
than trying to get them to agree with you on the fundamental stuff to begin with and then arguing from there, right? So like, for example, to pick a non-gender, you know, example of this, like, let's say you're having an argument about animal rights, right? And you're having an argument with someone who does not think that animals lives and pain and suffering are of equal moral consideration to humans, right? This is an official view. There are philosophical uh, defenses of this view, right? It's called anthropocentrism, right? And so the basic idea is that there are values, right? Degrees of with which we value things. And so in the hierarchy of values, right? Anthropocentrists put human beings at the top and they have what they feel are very good justifiable reasons for this, right? And it tends to have to do with the fact that they want individuals or beings with moral standing to have the capacity for rationality and, you know, all these other things that they think are unique to humans. So rather than, uh, let's say I'm not an anthropocentrist, right? And I, I want to argue with this, but I'm a, let's say I'm a sentiocentrist, right? I, I already think that humans and animals have equal moral consideration, or I could be a biocentrist. I think not only do humans and animals have equal moral consideration, but so do plants, <laughs> right, in the environment. Or it could be a biocentrist. And I think all living things and all of, right, like we could already be starting on so many different grounds, right, before the conversation even begins. Now, I could try to just convince them that humans and animals have the same moral standing, right? I could try to convince them to switch to being a sentiocentrist because obviously, equal rights flows much, right? Or animal rights flow much better <laughs> from a sentiocentrist perspective than anthropocentrism. That is gonna be probably only a conversation philosophers wanna have, <laughs> right? <laughs> Engaging in those debates. If you are able to find people in your lives who are, oh, love it, go with it, have the debates. Most people <laughs> are going to be much more receptive to an argument that already presumes that their starting points are right, even if you don't agree with them, right? And so more convincing arguments might be that it's actually in humans' best interest, right? Like, so let's go with it. You think humans are more valuable. Okay, I can still get you to care about animal rights, even if it's just for your own <laughs> benefits, right? And then you make the arguments from there, right? So there are different, different tactics here. And so I do think common ground can be had, but unfortunately, it's sort of like, you have to pick the strategy that will work best with whoever the audience is, right? And whoever the, the individual target is at that moment. Oh, target, that's a terrible word. But you know, the, the, the group, the group or person, right? Or institution that you are trying to affect change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, unfortunately, I don't, I, I still don't think that I, I can think of anything. Can any of you think of anything that we could argue exists without the influence of men? See, I can't even name anything that we want to associate strictly with like biological females or because all that stuff historically has been told to us, <laughs> uh, studied, <clears throat> named, described, right? Like it, the whole picture has been drawn for us by men, right? Um, as we're learning that like most medical books don't even have a proper anatomical depiction of female the female reproductive system, and that is as scientifically accurate as I'll get with it. <laughs> but uh, look into it more if you're curious about why that is, right? <laughs> like, um, this is these are not accidents. Um, let's see, and it influence pretty much everything. Yep, yep. That's the sad thing is that does not surprise me in the least. Yeah, and yeah, Isabel, excellent point. Even terms that I've thought a lot about this because I'm very interested in psychology. Um, there's a lot of overlap, I think, the kinds of questions that philosophers and psychologists try to answer. They just tend to go about answering them in different ways. Um, but yeah, this idea of terms, like actual terms that we have for, in this case, when we're othering something, we're othering cognitive states, right? So we're, we're othering states of mind, ways of being, right? States of consciousness. And so we have like what is deemed normal, right? <laughs> Psychological and cognitive states uh, of being. And then we have the abnormal, right? Which is then uh, medicalized and created, turned into an illness. 
um, I'm sure all of you know, not, uh, I'm sure you, you might not have all known what Isabel shared with us, but um, I don't know if you all know that uh, PMS used to be an official psychological condition, right? Mental illness, technically, right? Um, since those terms have historically been used interchangeably. Um, so that means once a month, For most individuals who experience menstruation, obviously there's a great variety, right, across that. But once a month you were mentally ill, right? Uh, and I mean, people still use these same types of ideas to justify women not being in charge, right? Oh, we don't want a woman setting off a nuclear bomb when she's on her period. Because women are so much. <laughs> So, so much quicker to the draw. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So the word lunacy, um, for those of you who don't know, comes from the word lunar, right? So it's tied to the moon. The moon is tied to our menstrual cycles, which males also have monthly cycles. If you did not know, they don't involve menstruation, <laughs> but they do involve um uh, hormone level changes, which can result in emotional state changes, right? Being more, I know it's not just us. Um, but so yeah, that word lunacy came from the idea. And I actually think the origination of werewolves is tied to this as well, right? The idea that people go crazy during a full moon, right? This is like all sort of tied together in the same uh, folklore, I think, uh, that, you know, there's a connection to the moon where once a month, <laughs> it's going to make people uh, behave erratically, right, and uncontrollably. And then over the course of time, this becomes less mysticized and more scientific and empirical. And so we develop DSMs full of, <laughs> full of things that uh, classify what might just be socially unacceptable behavior, right? It may not necessarily be mental illness, Right. So there are all sorts of conversations to be had about what it means if you classify yourself as having a particular condition, psychological condition, right? Something that has been named <laughs> and given a medical criteria, whatever you want to call it. Right. We tend to kind of lump all those things together and give them, portray them in a very negative light. And so it's, just like everything else in institutions of learning, right? Even in, the, in our religions, right? So too in academia and in science, right? We need to go back and we need to review the history and see where these ideas came from, right? What motivated them? In some cases, the motivation is just starkly discriminatory, right? In other cases, not so much, but the implications might be really problematic, right? And so there's lots of, you know, things that we have to do. And one of the um, elements, yeah, hysteria. Yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned that um, that is tied to the root for the, uh, it's the Latin word for womb, I think, but I can't remember what the word is, but that's, so if someone is being hysterical, right, it's literally they're suffering from a disease of the womb. And so to cure women of their hysteria, you, they were often accused of having wandering womb syndrome. And so in order to nail down the womb, I think I mentioned this before, the only way to do that, can anyone remember? How do you, how do you cure a wandering womb, Hazel? You get married. Not even that necessarily. What comes after? What comes after? Babies always have those babies. <laughs> Gotta have those babies, right? It's gonna solve all the problems, okay? So if a woman was experiencing hysteria, right? The medical cure for her prescribed by the doctor was pregnancy. I am not kidding you. And I am as horrified as all the looks on your faces, right? So why does this matter? Well, not only have we seen with FGM, right, at the beginning of the term, and if any of you were able to watch the Honor Diaries, right, we're still seeing other forms of violence, right, in other traditions as well, not just Hinduism, right, that get 
mistakenly tied to a religion, right? That have medical implications. Um, but also just in terms of general violence, right? Experienced by women. There are particular things that plague women today, such as, uh, you know, we're going to see this word come up when we talk about new religious traditions, new age, right? So a lot of new age medicine, new age spirituality, right? So these are outside of the problematic institutions of the past, and they cater specifically to women and other groups who have been marginalized by those institutions. But what happens as a result is something like what you see with Goop. Are you all familiar with the company Goop? So this is Gwyneth Paltrow's um, alternative medicine stuff where they have they like the Jade. They made a Netflix show about it too. They have, yeah, a couple documentaries about it. But it's very cult-like um, in its approach to alternative medicine, right? So um, things outside of uh, what we would consider to be like public medical practice. Um, <clears throat> and there's a reason why women are drawn to this, right? And even wealthy women, women with a lot of privilege, because let's be honest, none of Goop product, like that was, I think, Stephen Colbert's running joke about, <laughs> if any of you saw his stuff at Covington House, he made jokes about the Goop things. But I'm, I'm not kidding. I think one of the craziest things I saw was like a rose gold straw for, you know, $700, like expensive stuff. <laughs> um, but some of the medicine stuff that they advocate for is meant to be as an alternative, right, to more mainstream forms of medicine. And there are a lot of really wonderful things to be said about what we might call more homeopathic or natural remedies to things. But in this particular case, we're dealing with corporate individuals driven by profit who are not subject to the same regulations and controls as medicines would be, right? Um, and so there, you might have seen some instances of this. I think it was a um, caffeine enema, which I am not going to explain to you. You can maybe incognito window that later. <laughs> That's gross. Not sexual, just gross. <laughs> Medically necessary, I know. <laughs> but all right. Um, and so people were basically burning the insides of their intestines by using this product, right, that had not been tested and all of these other things. And um, a lot of other women have gotten like toxic shock from some of the um, products, right, that, that were being heralded as natural and safe and alternative and all these wonderful things. But so the reason I bring this up is that the women who are drawn to this, you know, oftentimes people want to criticize them or say, you know, make some sort of condemnation of oh, it's their choice or blah, blah, blah. But there's a social contribution to that, which is women en masse do not feel heard by the medical community. And this is especially the case for women of color. And none of these women are wrong. They are correct. <laughs> their doctors are not listening to them right? The doctors have intense bias, right? It's actually been demonstrated that the more pain you exhibit, the less likely your doctor is to prescribe you pain medication, which means the less pain you exhibit, the more likely your doctor is to prescribe you pain medication. And that is because they are trained to look out for people who are drug addicts. And that's the bias governing those observations. Gender biases, what types of biases can we think of that we are aware of that could be coming up with why doctors do not believe women and that this would drive them to alternative forms? Yes, good. So oftentimes, right, however the individual is presenting, um, whatever their described symptoms are, even if they're not presenting at that exact moment, Doctors will often not believe whatever is being relayed to them, right? Uh, many doctors are even taught that patients lie, right? So they're taught to distrust the patient's own recounting. Um, other, other gendered elements here. It, it does have to do a lot with disbelief. What in particular don't doctors believe when women are reporting? I mean, aside from sexual assault, I'm talking of here in a medical instance of well, not that that doesn't intervene, but 
What in particular do doctors not believe when women report? Definitely stuff relating to menstruation again, because there's such a wide variety and so few studies, but uh, pain in general, actually. So general accounting of pain, doctors do not believe women or they think that women have a higher pain tolerance. And so they are less likely to take the exclamations and the complaining of pain, right? As serious as, as seriously as they would from a woman, as they would from a man. Or you have the reverse. You think women complain too much and you think that they are exaggerating, right? Their reports of pain and that they're not in fact Yes, and it has to do with the idea that if women can, right, women, this is let the, and they always make that comparison too. <laughs> like men claiming that they know that something is less or more painful than childbirth. <laughs> how would they know, <laughs> right? And how would any of us know unless we've gone through it? And even then, women have such different experiences, right? Just because one individual might have had many births that all went well, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Toxic shock. Yep. Yeah. But gotta have, gotta keep it tight got to keep it tight. <laughs> keep your man satisfied. That's the justification. That's the just, why else do you need to do kegels? <laughs> I guess the one other time I've heard of women doing kegels is because after you give birth, sometimes you pee a little <laughs> when you laugh. <laughs> right. And so it's something about strengthening the, some of the walls. I don't know. <laughs> See, I don't even know. I don't even know enough about it. <laughs> That's how little, right? Our knowledge of ourselves is uh, actually coming from women. Yeah, and of course, this is all, yeah, Kylie, you're exactly right. This is even more so the case with women of color. There's, oh, there's a book, <laughs> if you're interested uh, in being horrified about the entire history of medicine. Uh, but it is educational, it is informative, but one of the most horrifying things I recall reading in this book, which I'm only halfway through, so sure, it can only get better, um, were experiments done on slave women, right? Just horrific, horrific, under the guise of scientific knowledge and all this, you know, there's always some larger utilitarian purpose given to it, but, um, you know, no consideration of the individual suffering and no anesthetic given, even though there existed something like that at the time, like they were just denied it, right? Their pain didn't count. Um, so yeah, we're living in a time where people are gonna continue to make decisions about our bodies and these individuals continue to be mostly, if not all men. And so as we move into these newer religions, right? There's a reason why people are flocking to them, even if, outside of a spiritual element, right? Even if just for other types of well-being, right? For physical well-being, for mental well-being. The original practice of lobotomies, yes. Yeah. yeah. And this has to do with, right? The idea that probably it's psychological comfort, right? Oh, I don't have to feel as bad about the slave being whipped right? If I convince myself that they have a higher pain tolerance, right? That they don't feel pain in the same way I do. If I convince myself that they are worth less, right? That they're, right? In the cases of racism, right? Often on the same or if not a lower level than animals, right? That mindset is serving a purpose, right? It's helping them to continue to justify these things, right? So, why is this, again, important for us? Beliefs are tied to actions, right? And so when we talk about even religious beliefs, right, they're always going to have implications in terms of how we act. All right. Okay, so we're kind of free, free flowing here, new religions, not religion. <laughs> so let's just keep, let's just keep it open. Uh, any other questions, things that we want to discuss? <laughs> I was going to say, I cannot wait to read that, but also I am scared.
to our point earlier, right, one way of going at this is to try to explain how feminism is not communist. <laughs> and even if it is socialist, it's not going to be socialist in the ways that he's probably thinking, <laughs> right? And it certainly is not trying to what destroy families. Uh, break apart traditional families. Right. Tear so them apart. There's, you could directly go after those things, right? Or you might convey the ways in which feminism fought against communism, right? Or fought for, uh, you know, give them some examples of where they fought in favor of the traditional families, right? You know, or something like showing them, uh, like there's so many examples of feminists doing work for non-feminists, right? And individually associated with feminism. Um, I think some of the examples that I found are all of the, all of the work that feminist activists have done for um, men in prisons, like men in prisons <laughs> and the protections and rights that they have fought and that won for them, right? Like what, if if the feminists are the, you know, the individuals as they've been portrayed thusly, <laughs> right? What, what possible explanation could they have for that? Um, so yeah, like that might be, but again, we might just also end up in situations where there is no reasoning with people, right? People are going to hear or not hear what they want to hear and not everyone is ready to hear what you have to say. <laughs> um, so there's there's only so much one can do, uh, but yeah, sometimes it's my, like, okay, not worth, <laughs> not worth diving into that minefield at the moment. That is also perfectly legitimate. <laughs> yeah, yep, being brainwashed, yep. That's what my dad warned me about by my philosophy professors too. So he must've been right. <laughs> Here I am doing the same thing to you all. But again, this is why Socrates was put to death, corrupting the youth. I like, that's what I'm doing. Someone put to death for that. I could have been, I mean, I'm a woman too. I will forget it. <laughs> I'm probably a witch too. <laughs> my grandpa thinks <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Very frustrating. But I'm going to get that righteous anger, right? Turn that anger into something positive. There's so, there's so many things that we cannot control and that's horrifying, right? <laughs> um, and so much of what we try to do and especially in philosophy, right, is to be persuasive, right? Um, so you're, you're, you're trying to change other people while also recognizing that perhaps no, you, you, the only person you can change is yourself, right? There's perhaps that paradox, but you don't even like, that's why I'm thinking like, I don't even think that should be the goal. I like, I don't want to undermine the skills I'm trying to teach you. <laughs> be persuasive, <laughs> try, try to make others better as you improve yourself, like definitely all that. But at the same time, if that is the goal, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? And you're setting yourself up for disappointment and you're setting yourself up for probably so much heartache that it's going to dissuade you from wanting to try anything ever. And you'll just be totally jaded and want to give up like that. That fatigue is real. <laughs> I'm sure you're seeing that even from the, the people who are activists, right? Out there in the world. Like I see it amongst like everyone is exhausted of the fight, <laughs> right? And you have to find whatever it is, the thing that keeps you going, right? Um, it could be focusing on the next generation, right? If, if, okay, like you guys are, you, you're set in your ways. <laughs> I can't change you, but there is a group that is still open and still un, uh, tethered, right? Uh, and they are not sort of kept in a finite space where they are at least open to make their own beliefs. And so that's that's really the only thing I want to encourage you all to do. And that's I think the the be all end all of why I do what I do is I just want to encourage as many of you as possible and as many people as possible to just think for yourself. Just just don't give that just that power away to anybody else. If if that's the only thing you can control in your life is what you believe, just do it for yourself. <laughs> don't outsource it. If you have to outsource everything else. Don't outsource your mind. <laughs> We want to bumper sticker it like <laughs> that is the thing. Um, and so the process of even going through our own thoughts and figuring out what we've chosen to believe and what maybe 
wow, I, I believe that. And I, I definitely wouldn't choose to believe that, right? Uncovering our own bias. That, that I think is the hardest work. And I think on my realistic, but best day, the best I can hope for is that other people will see you living that example and find it invitational, right? Find it welcoming. And that's how I've found to be around my family and friends. Not so much like I, I used to really be with the arguments, <laughs> the conflict and the confrontation. Um, you know, like any good undergraduate who's in college, <laughs> figuring out what they believe. But now it's much more, you know, through the way I act and through how open and caring, right, just demonstrating that inclusivity, right, and that way of mind. And so when I'm around family members and they see the joy and the peace and the, you know, still proper understanding of reality, right, it's not tied to this illusion, I, I hope that people are drawn to it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the, that's the nugget. <laughs> you can, we'll try our best. Um, but I think the work we do on ourselves will be the most meaningful, even in terms of trying to convince other people.